Welcome everyone. I'm um, just waiting a few more minutes to, to let a couple more people in, but we are so excited to have you here today. Um, this is our May Author Connect chat, um, part of our ongoing series where we meet and sit down with um, business authors each month, learn about their new titles, and um, have a Q&A session. So um, I am your host, Carlin Hickson. I work with authors, publishers, agents, speakers bureaus, publicists, marketers, editors, and other incredible industry partners at BookPal. Um, we are a specialty retailer and we believe books have the power to ignite continuous learning and growth. Um, our guest today is gonna to provide some insights from his latest book, Fix This Next. Um, we will have a little bit of a Q&A chat at the end as well. Please do feel free to submit any questions that you have at any time during the webinar in the chat or in the Q&A boxes below. And um, please, as just a quick reminder to keep yourself muted during the presentation today. I'm so excited, honored, and thrilled to introduce our guest. He has launched three multi-million dollar businesses before his 35th birthday. Uh, selling one to private equity and one to a Fortune 500 company. He was awarded the New Jersey SBA's Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award when he was only 26. Uh, can't think of anyone better to speak to entrepreneurs today. He is the author of several incredible books and resources, including the latest, Fix This Next, Clockwork, Surge, The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur, The Pumpkin Plan, and Profit First. His books have been translated into over 20 different languages, and he's also a former small business columnist for the Wall Street Journal and an active partner in multiple companies, including an American manufacturer, a business growth consultancy, an augmented reality tech firm, and a certification organization for accountants, bookkeepers, and business coaches. Please join me in welcoming Mike Michalowicz. Carlin, thank you for that kind introduction. The one part you left off is we're both alumni from the greatest university in Virginia, at least. The best. I the did best. leave that off. Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech. That's awesome. Hey, I, I forgot to ask you, how long, I, I know I'm going to share my presentation, but how long did you want me to go before we do Q&A? Um, about 15 minutes or so. Or yeah, okay. That's what I thought. Okay. I just want to make sure I pace it appropriately. Well, I'm ready to go. So thank you for that kind introduction. I'll, I'll dig right into it. So... Um, I sent out an email, Carlin, this is about uh, five years ago. It takes me about five years to write a book. Uh, there's a lot of research, there's development of the thesis or hypothesis that ultimately has to be validated or contested and it can turn into a thesis. And then, then I start the writing phase. So five years ago, uh, what I did, and I, I've written six books now, for every single book, I will email my readership and say, what's the biggest challenge you're facing in the year ahead? Now my readership is small business owners. So I emailed out five years ago to small business owners and uh, I'm not the most technically savvy, even though I graduated from an engineering school, um, barely graduated from an engineering school. I am not the most technically savvy and I must have like triple clicked or something because the same email went out asking the same questions multiple times in one day. And the, and the, the core question was, what's the biggest challenge you face in your business? Well, some people, the same person, responded multiple times in the same day to that same question with different answers. I remember one entrepreneur who said, uh, the biggest challenge I face, it was in the morning, said, is sales. We need more sales this year than ever before. And he responded again in the afternoon saying, I know what the biggest challenge is. It's hiring. We don't have good enough people. And then by the evening, it was not a clear vision. That was their challenge. And that's when I concluded that the biggest challenge business owners have is knowing what their biggest challenge is. And uh, we constantly put out fires. And I, I bet you if the folks listening in right now, I can see the participants uh, still coming on board. So welcome everyone. I mean, one of the biggest challenges we have is the fact we're always putting out fires because we don't know what we need to take care of. So the, the epitome of the entrepreneurial life for so many of us is come in the morning with a great plan to crush the day. And then the stream of email questions come in that one customer that's never satisfied uh, the questions lined up outside our door and we're putting out fires for the entirety of the day. And the next day repeats and repeats again. Well, there's a demonstrative and I'll, I'll try to draw it out here on a piece of paper and anyone following in, you can do it on a piece of paper along with me of why we stick in this, this crisis. I call it the survival trap. And um, what you do is to grab a piece of paper. I have a, a 
like a notepad here and draw the letter A in the center of a piece of paper and put a circle around it. And what A represents for our business or for our life is where we are right now in this moment. So right now, it's point A. And for many businesses, particularly because this is the pandemic, the COVID crisis is happening, point A for business is crisis and challenge and fear. And so then as the second step, what I want you to do is draw three arrows uh, that represent three choices in any direction you choose away from A. So three arrows away from A, don't show me, and uh, Carol and yours, Carl and yours, and uh, anyone paying on, you know, listening in, you can't show me yours, but I'll show you mine. Those are three arrows I drew. What these arrows represent are decisions we can make to escape crisis, to get out of the now. And this is what we do to run a business. You have a situation, how do I get out of this difficult situation? But the final third step, in the bottom center, I want you to draw the letter B. And that letter B represents the vital need our business has. What's the one thing our business needs to, us to do for it to navigate through its current situation? And chances are, and Carlin, I'd love to see your piece of paper now. Chances are few arrows, maybe no arrows point to B. Let me see in your case. You have one pointing to B, okay. And I have none pointing to B. And when I ask people to do this example, um, often it's zero or one arrow pointing to B. There's a problem with both scenarios. In my scenario, I'm making decisions that take me actually away from B. In one, one case, it takes me in the polar opposite direction of B, and I actually get further away from what my business needs because I don't know what my business needs. Most people draw no arrows toward B because we didn't know what B was. How could we? And that's how we operate our business. We don't know what our business needs next. We only know where our business is now. And sometimes, and Carl, in your example, we draw an arrow that happens to go to B without knowing where B was. You had this scenario. That's called happenstance, and happenstance happens. You didn't know where B was, but you moved there. The experience for entrepreneurs is like this. You're putting out fires, putting out fires, and then one day, miraculously, everything clicks. You're like, hallelujah, I, I figured it out. I'm doing the right things. I'm moving forward. Things are kicking butt. I own this. And then the next day, when you come back into work, it's a shit storm. It all falls apart again, right? And we're like, what? What's going on? That's because of happenstance. Sometimes we make a decision that moves us in the direction the business needs it, but without knowing where B is. And the result is we simply put ourselves in a new A. In fact, in any of these scenarios, when we're escaping crisis or challenge, leaving this, we're getting temporary relief, but we're moving to a new A. And then we have to get temporary relief by escaping the new A. And many businesses start moving in this circuitous pattern of just getting stuck in the A over and over and over again. That's called a survival trap. And that's how most businesses are operated. And that's the biggest challenge. We need to escape that. We need to know what we need to address. And um, to do that, we need to take a second step. That's what I did all for this research for this book. And if we flip the back over the book, on the back, I have this thing. I'll hold it close to the screen so anyone that's watching, you can take a screenshot if you wish. It's the business hierarchy of needs. What I did was I evaluated Maslow's hierarchy of needs and found there's a common um, a commonality is probably the better choice of words, commonality between humanity and business. When you look at multiple people lined up together, like if Carlin, you and I are standing next to each other, we're very easy to distinguish as different. Gender, skin color, accent, height, all those different elements make it very easy, easy to distinguish who's who. But when you peel back the skin of humanity, our biology is the same. Like if I was rushed to the hospital today because I'm having cardiac arrest, the doctor, when she examines me, she wants to say, um, your heart, is your heart in your foot, Mike? Or, you know, the heart's always in the same spot. When we do an operation, we always know where to go because the biology of humanity is basically identical, the DNA, if you will. Well, in business, when we look at it from the outside, businesses are so radically different. A pizza shop from an aviation company to lawyers to uh, someone on Etsy, they're so different. But the reality is when we peel back the skin of business, there's a common DNA. That common DNA is this, it's the business hierarchy of needs. Now, I translated this from what's called Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Maslow was studying human needs and I found that there's a very akin similarity in business with one substantial difference. Maslow studied human needs and said that foundationally, every human being has what's called physiological needs. We need to breathe air, drink water, eat food and so forth. Only once those are adequately satisfied can we serve as higher level needs. The next level need up is safety, protection from harm, violence, 
injury. The next level above that's belonging, the highest level is self-actualization. And Maslow argued at any given time, if a base level needs not being satisfied, we'll revert to it. Uh, for example, right now, what we're doing, talking about these book concepts, that could be considered part of the esteem or self-actualization, the highest levels of the Maslowian hierarchy of needs. But as I'm express expressing this, if someone came up and like put a plastic bag over my head and wrapped duct tape around my neck, which I live in New Jersey, it's actually kind of possible. If that, if that happens, all of a sudden, I will biologically respond with the necessity to tear this bag open so I can breathe because my physiological need to consume oxygen is not being addressed. Well, in our business, we have a similar hierarchy of needs. Foundationally, every business needs sales. Sales is similar to the creation of oxygen. It's, you have no oxygen, you have no sales, you have no, your, your business is suffocating. The next level above that is profit. We need to have enough sales, enough oxygen to breathe, to then address the next need, which is profit. Profit is the creation of stability in the organization. Sadly, in this environment we're experiencing now with recession upon us, many businesses are struggling because they weren't profitable in the first place. They are caught off guard. As Warren Buffett said, when the, when the tide goes out, you see who's swimming naked. When the recession goes out, you see what businesses have not consider, been concerned with profitability. The level above that's order. Order is the creation of efficiency. And this is where we bring organizational efficiency. The ultimate asset test is that the business owner can be removed from the business for an extended period, at least four consecutive weeks, and the business continues to hum along, maybe even grow. That's an indicator of efficiency, organizational efficiency. The level above that's called impact. Impact is the creation of transformation. This is when businesses realize they are not in the service of transactions, but they're in the service of those transactions providing transformation. You're, you're, you're causing people's lives to shift in some format. One example I use is Harley Davidson. You can buy a motorcycle anywhere. I, I don't drive a motorcycle, even though I'm, my nickname is Mike Motorbike, which is ironic. Um, but uh, I don't drive a motorcycle, but you can buy a motorcycle anywhere. But if you buy a Harley Davidson, for example, now you belong to the Harley Davidson tribe. You're, you're, you're a weekend warrior. Um, you belong to a family. And that's transformational in people's lives. The next level above that and the highest level is called legacy. Legacy is the creation of permanence. And as I was doing my research for this book and interviewing uh, other entrepreneurs, I discovered something fascinating here. This is where entrepreneurs realized they were never business owners in the first place. They've always been business stewards, meaning they had a responsibility to bring life to this entity, but it's about the entity itself. It's, it's ongoing continuity. It's service to the community. And that their involvement in the business is insignificant compared to the business. It's more important that the business survives. That's legacy. And what we have to do is we simply navigate this hierarchy, not like a ladder, you don't climb up it. You will cycle through it to where the imminent need is. There's two simple questions you can ask. Starting always at the foundation, like the Maslow hierarchy of needs, we've got to make sure oxygen, water, and food's satisfied first. We ask ourselves, are we satisfied with sales? And there's two simple ways to ask. Are there any sales? If there's no sales, you got, you're not breathing, you need sales. And then is there adequate sales to support the next level, which is profit. And the only way you can know that is by looking at the link. You go to profit and say, is there any profit? Well, you link it, look at the sales. If we have some sales and no profit, is it because we need a little more sales to support profit? Or in many cases, do we simply need a profit system to drive profit from the existing sales? Once you've satisfied that, you ask the next question. Do we have any profit? And then do we have adequate profit to support order? And you keep on asking those questions as you move up. The second you don't pass one of those tests, you don't have any or adequate, that's the level you're at and you must address. Now in this, this uh, situation we're experiencing with the pandemic, many businesses that were maybe serving at levels of building efficiency or impact or even trying to establish legacy have reverted to sales. Amazon itself, which is such a wildly successful company in some perspectives, uh, uh, and we buy so much stuff from, reverted back to sales. They, they repositioned what they did. They actually started not selling books. They deprioritized it. Thank God for BookPal, who prioritized it, just pointing that out. Um, but even these juggernaut companies reverted to the base. And you see it in your own community. We have restaurants here that were uh, really established, really popular. They had their systems down. They were focusing on impact and transformation, communion uh, of the community itself. And now they reverted to selling in a new way. They had to reinvent themselves. And by using this hierarchy, there's actually one restaurant right in this town who said we have their need to reinvent sales. That's part of the sales process. And now doesn't have a restaurant anymore. They do cooking classes for their past patrons. So their past patrons are now cooking their favorite meals at home. And they have that community again because these cooking classes are run with multiple 
uh, people from their neighborhoods. They're connecting with neighbors new and old. And the restaurant has achieved sales uh, because they're selling those cooking classes and now extracting profit from it. Interestingly, more profitable than ever before. And the last thing I want to share, because I know we're running out of time here, is the concept of omen. What, what this business hierarchy of needs shows you is what you need to work on. A lot of people know their why. We know our purpose. We got to serve things. And, and you know how, in many cases, to, to resolve things. You know actions to take. The question is what to work on. Many of us, you know, we can constantly tread water because we know how to fix problems. What we just did with the business hierarchy of needs is we pinpointed what to work on. And now we're going to put your talents there and your business is going to thrive forward. The last part I want to share is this concept called OMEN. It stands, it's an acronym, and it stands for a methodology to measure and track how you're resolving your B, the next thing you need to do. And OMEN is, well, the acronym stands for four things. O stands for objective. What are we trying to do? So if we have a sales challenge, for example, that we've identified, is it prospects? Okay, then the objective is perhaps more prospects. M stands for measurements. Measurements are simply setting the metrics behind how we know if we're making progress or not. How many prospects do we need? Um, what, what level of purchasing do they need to make from us and so forth? And many business owners understand the O and the M, they miss the next two parts. E is evaluation frequency. How often are we gonna check in on our progress? Sadly, many business owners under such duress, it's a set it and forget it. Well, we need more prospects and we need a lot of them. That's the whole system. And then a year later, we check back and say, oh my gosh, I never really monitored what I was doing. Did we do it? So evaluation is checking in frequently, maybe once a week or once a month to see your progress. And the last letter, N, stands for nurture. Nurture is reassessing the metrics and the objective and even the evaluation frequency we set to see if new data has presented itself that maybe we should have set the objective differently. Maybe this one wasn't more prospects. Maybe we actually had enough prospects. It was more about converting the right prospects, being more selective. Maybe we should have been evaluating more frequently or maybe set different metrics. Nurture gives us the, uh, the right, if you will, or the ability to change dynamically what we're doing. So that's the three elements of Fix This Next. And what I found is it's a beautiful thing. The book just released a week ago. Uh, the system is literally this simple. You can, you can cut out, the, you can take the dust cover and cut the back and stick it above your desk. And what it brings about is between every action and reaction, like we showed in this diagram, here's the action, what's going on, here's our reactions. There needs to be contemplation or consideration. And that simple hierarchy of needs, when there's an action, we can say, does this fit within what my business needs now? Is it part of my B or is it not? And if it's part of your B, now you start deliver, deliberately moving forward here, you start seeing results. I'm so lucky, even though this came out a week ago, I get email after email already. Actually, one came in 25, 23 minutes ago, right before the top of the hour, um, of someone implementing Fix This Next. Because I invite readers to reach out to me and tell me their progress. You will start seeing immediate, impactful change once you start doing the right things and focus on the right challenge, not just any challenge. So that's Fix This Next. I love it. I love how simple and yet effective, um, you know, establishing the BHN and then using that OMEN um, uh, tool to assess your progress. Thanks, Carlin. Um, and I think honestly, you know, having this book right now, Fix This Next, you know, obviously didn't plan to <laughs> publish it during a pandemic, but I actually think it's good timing. <laughs> Isn't that ironic? So yeah, I wrote this for Business Crisis yeah. because that's what business owners are under constantly. Right. You know, a rise of a competitor and they take, in, take away your client or an employee leaves that was so loyal to your company and you don't know how to do the stuff now. Mm -hmm. With the pandemic, it's triggered what's called macroeconomic crisis, which then in turn triggers crises within crisis. So right. with the macroeconomic crisis, we have mi micro crisis in businesses. So it is ironic that this, this book w was born for this, um, mm -hmm. but I wish it wasn't necessary for this, you know? Right. I mean, and I know you started obviously getting feedback early on and just the formulation of fix, fix this next. Do you find as of the publication and maybe um, even the months leading up to it, is the biggest struggle then just, I mean, probably people could identify many needs, if not dozens of vital needs. Is the struggle just kind of figuring out where to start? Do you find that that's the biggest struggle? Yeah, the biggest struggle is bringing down singularity. So there can only be one most important thing. Um, 
there can only be one priority, yet it is human nature to say, well, we have multiple priorities. There's many things that are most important, but that by definition can't be true. Right. Yet that feels like our necessary approach. We are overwhelmed, particularly nowadays, by distraction. So we are doing partial solutions as opposed to impactful solutions for all these different things. Mm -hmm. And that's why businesses are actually, we see more activity in businesses. People are working longer hours today than ever before. Businesses owners are more dependent upon business owners. In fact, the, the, the mentality now is this grind and hustle mentality, which I'm retaliating against. It is the worst definition of entrepreneurship. Yet everyone's like, not everyone, but many authorities are like, you must hustle and grind. And, uh, you know, entrepreneurship is not defined as hustle and grind and doing the work. Entrepreneurship is clarity on a vision, on an outcome, the way you want a company or an organization to be of service. And then it's organizing the resources around you to achieve that. Yet it's become so bastardized and there's such attention dis deficiency that we're constantly trying to do everything. And it's actually slowing us down more and more and more. So what yeah. I'm trying to do in this book is get people back on the course of pick, identify the one thing and do one thing at a time. We must do this kind of serial sequencing of one thing at a time and it'll have much greater impact. But to your point, it is hard for us, including myself, to do that because there's so much that needs to be done. Right. Um, we actually did have a couple more questions come in. Um, Danielle asks, do you have any suggestions for leaders on how to host better discussions around the hierarchy of needs um, and figuring out what is the highest priority with their teams? Great question, Danielle. So uh, two things. One I suggest is uh, first empathetic listening, um, which sounds like a kind of a weird way to give people direction. But um, particularly now, uh, there is a lot of the dynamics going on outside the office that are influencing people's office performance. Our own office here, now we're a small company, we have 12 employees here. Uh, and our president, her name's Kelsey. I own the business, but we, we have a president in place for this location, Kelsey. And uh, what we've started, we've instituted is a weekly one-on-one -on -one meeting to understand everyone's individual needs and intentions. Once we figured out their intentions and their individual needs, then our job is to see is to direct um, our company toward a goal while also satisfying people's individual needs. Often we skip over that. You know, the company needs to achieve $10 million in revenue or whatever the objective is without consideration on what other people need. In fact, I came out of my own office, this was a year ago, and said, that was the number, $10 million. I said, I see the path, $10 million. This is gonna be our $10 million a year. We got this going on. And I had the drums rolling. I had all this exciting, you know, in indoor fireworks going off. And uh, it was like, wah, wah. like no, no one cared. I'm like, what's going on? And the response was like, Mike, you get the new house or the new car, but why do we care about it? And that's when I came to realize that everyone has their own intentions for their lives. Kelsey's been very good at choreographing sat the satisfaction of everyone's intentions. One of the team members here, her name is Jenna. Jenna was looking to buy a house. Um, well, Kelsey's been having a regular dialogue with her and with this pandemic, they sold their old house. Uh, they were looking to buy a new one, but then the pandemic hit. So all the mortgage uh, offers went away or changed. So they were homeless. And you know, I'm chowing under, we're gonna do $10 million. Jenna's worrying about having a home. And <laughs> you know, what's more important to Jenna? And so Kelsey under, understood that. We dynamically adjusted her, her job requirements so that she could actively seek a home and have that flexibility. And Jenna and every other team member here is so loyal to the goal because they see that the goal of the company really is to satisfy everyone's goals. So that's what I do. Empathetically listen. And then step two, choreograph the goal of your organization, Danielle, to meet, match up with everyone else's individual intentions for themselves. I love that. Um, Danielle had also asked if there's a poster version of the BHN. Um, there is. And so if you go to fixthisnext.com, um, down at the very bottom of the page, it says free resources. And there's a uh, picture of the BHN. Uh, it's not necessarily poster size, like, you know, you can put on your wall, but it's, it's a sizable piece and you can expand it out if you wish. That's actually my intention. I talk about that in the book that once you understand the concept and dive into the, the details in the book, that the book becomes a reference tool, but this BHN is simply stuck on the wall to, to constantly be your compass. I, I shared the story of a woman named Amanda Eller. Amanda Eller was a hiker in Hawaii, that's, that's her home state, and she's navigating the Hawaiian forest, which she does over and over again. She loves to do this. One day she's hiking and halfway through her hike, she decides to meditate. She walks off the path a little bit, meditates, and becomes disoriented when she comes out of her meditation. 
and then starts walking, trying to walk her way out, trust, trusting instinct alone. She went on for 17 days stuck in the Hawaiian forest. She was found, thank God, alive, but clinging to life because she trusted instinct. And what, the reason I share that story is that when it comes to our business, many business owners and leaders are trusting instinct and saying, here's what I feel we need to do. But if Amanda Eller simply had a compass, she could correlate her instinct to what's true north. That's the idea behind this. This is a compass for you and your business. It'll point to true north. And then we leverage our instinct, our experience, our skill set to maximize what we need to work on. Absolutely. I, I love what you said about really not only taking into account the business's needs and goals, but taking into account, you know, where your employees are and what their goals are and how it, you know, kind of what's in it for them in terms of just achieving that growth. You talk about that um, pretty extensively in, in different transitions you guys have done at your company in your book. And I thought it was fascinating some of the transitions of getting employees to the point where they could take like a two week sabbatical or, you know, transitioning, um, you know, their tasks, how, yeah. how, I guess from a tactical plan, cause we're a small company too, but I love that idea of having that flexibility. Yes. How do you execute on that? Yeah. So as I have a business coach that says, Mike, sometimes the way out of the weeds is just walk out of the weeds. Sometimes the way to execute is just to do it. And then we backfill the appropriate actions. So I actually argue a four week vacation. What I found is the vast majority of businesses move in four week or monthly cycles. You know, we have billings, collections, invoicing, client satisfaction, all those things, employees, hiring, firing, usually will happen within a four week period. Any of those elements can happen. And some of them are just scheduled to happen that frequently. Therefore, my conclusion, I wrote about it in another book of mine called Clockwork, is that if the business owner can be extracted for four consecutive weeks, a full physical and digital disconnect, there's a high probability that business is no longer dependent on the owner into perpetuity, allowing the owner to reinsert themselves in any way they choose. Um, and that's actually how we started with my own business. Years back, I started taking these four-week vacations and the business, that's when we got, uh, we instilled uh, Kelsey as our leader, uh, as our president and, and uh, everyone else elevated up. And now I was able to reinsert myself in the way I desire. I like to be a spokesperson for the organization and I love being an author. So that's the two things I do. But then the realization was I just basically led or transferred all of my responsibilities, responsibilities over to Kelsey. So now Kelsey's the new linchpin, an employee. So we instilled the same thing, a four-week vacation. Ended up for Kelsey, we did an eight-week vacation, which we on sabbatical. And um, it's, the key is it's not like you declare the, the four-week vacation tomorrow, but I think for your employees and, your, and if you're a business owner yourself, schedule it for a year to 18 months from today. Once you schedule it, there is this kind of aha moment, like I didn't just do this, did I, kind of feeling. And then it's like, we gotta get busy on not doing the work, but designing the outcomes and delegating. Kelsey went right to work on systematizing what she did. Now, also as an employee, Kelsey came to one day and said, Mike, everything I am documenting, recording, giving to other people, I have less and less work to do. You won't need me after this is done. And it's the responsibility of the business owner to say, I will need you in a new capacity. Um, and because it can be threatening. You know, employees will use this to protect themselves. If you're the only person that knows, I can't get fired. Um, so Kelsey had that realization saying, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm working myself out of a job. I said, you're actually elevating yourself to a newer job. And it's absolutely back to the integrity of the owner. You must be compliant with what you share, what you say. So um, we elevated Kelsey the day she returned from her eight-week sabbaticals when we declared her as president of the company. And um, we're now, she's mandating that every employee here takes a four-week vacation, paid vacation, because we believe that our company um, should have no dependency on any individual. So it's cross training. Everyone should be incented and paid to systematize, to download from their mind so that they can elevate themselves to higher levels. And uh, a paid for vacation is not um, a great benefit to them alone. While it's received that way, honestly, the biggest benefactor is the business because we're not dependent on any individual employee. It's all been systematized. So we, the business, are the big winner in allowing and actually requiring employees to take an extended vacation. I love that. I mean, that's powerful. And I think a lot of people would appreciate just, you know, that, that trust and the systemization and ability to take that time off because. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's funny. Another friend of mine, uh, she says that we are in business to support our lives. We're not in life to support our business. Right. And um, I, I think we've lost a plot. Many business owners, and small businesses have lost the plot on that one. And uh, 
I think we need to get back to it that, you know, the business is here to be an amplification, a, a, a platform of expression and of service, and to be of service to ourselves, to give us freedom to experience life itself. So I think it's actually the responsibility of an organization. It's not easy, but it's the responsibility of the organization. Right. Once you're able to kind of um, handle the sales, the profit order. Kind right. Of and you got to get these in place, right? So that, what we're talking about is actually at the order level. But if, okay. if I have no money coming in, I mean, could you imagine this business? We're saying, you know, we have no money coming in. Uh, we're losing everything. We're nearly bankrupt. But guess what? Everyone's getting a paid for a vacation. Vacation. <laughs> Enjoy it. <laughs> really, you're getting fired and you're being paid by the government in your unemployment conversation because we don't have the structure there. So it, it's, it's mandated and it always plays out this way. You know, th this is played out by the biggest companies, GE, Procter Gamble, down to micro entrepreneurs of one. If you don't have sales, nothing else matters. Once you have some sales, profit must be focused on. As we go up this, all elements are playing out at all times. It's just where we concentrate, concentrating our fix. Just like right now, when we're talking, you and I are both breathing. It's not like we're actively thinking about it. It just happens because it's automatic. Well, that's true. The whole hierarchy is happening to some degree on automatic. It's just where we concentrate our energy to fix up that level so we can level up. Mm, I love it. So speaking of the last two levels, because I find those obviously are, are super important. And I love what you said that business owners eventually understand that they are stewards and um, yeah. just kind of trying to you know, shepherd their business along. How do you suggest if, if there are businesses, and I'm sure a lot of them are probably at that order level trying to kind of stabilize, how do they start that important work of you know, understanding what impact and legacy they are chasing after or do want to leave? Yeah, so one thing that's interesting is I found that um, it ties back to purpose. Uh, it's something I, I speak about in Fix This Next. I, I found there's actually kind of, there's this duality of purpose that pulls us forward to impact and legacy. And there's another element called ego that actually pulls us back down. And ego isn't necessarily always negative, but there is a negative context where ego is of comparison. So I found business owners that were focused on, do I have more sales than the other guy? You know, do I, am I making more money? Do I have the bigger house? We're actually pulled down to simply focusing on sales and the, and the money they can extract out of the business. The people focused on purpose started to elevate to higher levels, how they could transform their communities, uh, their, their, their state, their country, their world, our world, you know? And they were elevating these higher levels. What's interesting though, is there actually has to be um, the, the foundation still must be in place and that some businesses that were very purpose oriented or the owner was, they tried to skip levels and that was a calamity. Uh, not for profits, sadly, are notorious for this. Not for profits. So, you know, we're going to go out and change the world. We're going to cure this problem. We're going to have great impact. Um, and they skip the sales profit and order levels, meaning they don't have contributions. Uh, they have no stability for the organization and it's, it's not run efficiently whatsoever. They try to skip. And then these not-for-profits collapse rapidly. In fact, the, the, one of the most failing categories of all businesses is not-for-profits. Now, mm -hmm. sadly, a lot of for-profit for businesses, quite frankly, should be relabeled not-for-profit because they're skipping to impact. So we, we must always consider what's the purpose, what's pulling us up, but always satisfy these levels in a sequence. The last thing I want to share is I actually interviewed business owners that achieved these first three levels and said, you know what, I don't care about the impact on a grander scheme. I just care that I'm making the money I want to make, that I'm putting food in the fam on the table for my family, and I'm serving my employees and my, my clients. And you know what? That's fine. They may be kind of stopping at the order level, but they are still great contributors to our economy. Um, I just think that moment will come where we say, is this all there is? Is it just, just making money? Is, is this all there is? And when entrepreneurs face that, is this all there is? That's when we discover the next two levels and start playing into it much more. Absolutely. Um, couple like last questions. So for people who are newer, maybe to this book or to your work in general, I know you sort of touch on this on the book in the book, but, uh, should they start with fix this next? Should they start with another book? Great question. <laughs> so I used to enthusiastically say, Oh my gosh, you have to read profit first or clock or, or whatever book I was hyped up on because I just written the book. Right. Then I realized I was thrusting my own thoughts and energy to someone that may not benefit from that because they don't know what their biggest challenge is. So I have two answers. If you know what your biggest challenge in your business is for sure, then read the resource that serves that. Maybe it is one of my books, but maybe it's someone else's book, but discover that resource. And I believe books are the greatest resource on this planet, hands down. The thing is, if you don't know what your biggest challenge is, that's why I wrote, 
That's why I wrote this book. So if you don't know what your business needs from you right now, then read this book. This is the starting point. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Um, and if anybody is interested in um, booking you for a future event or virtual event, where should they go to inquire about that? So it's uh, mikemotorbike.com. That's the funny thing about my nickname. So uh, even though it's mikemichalowitz.com, no one can spell Michalowitz, Carlin, surpri surprisingly. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you wouldn't, when I, you know, I, I, tell you, I told you I played sports back at, at college when the announcers would be like, oh, you know, there's Mike Mc, 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 like, oh, they're talking about me. Um, so that's why I, I got that domain very early on. So mikemotorbike.com, if you go there, you can discover my other books. Uh, you can learn more about Fix This Next. But also, if you want to uh, do a virtual or live conference, just click on the little menu there for a speaker, and uh, we'll get in touch and, and explore that together. Awesome. Um, well, I do want to thank you again for being here. I think this is such an incredible resource. Um, and everybody who tuned, tuned in today and anyone who actually wasn't able to make it, but signed up, we did record the webinar. So we will be making that available. Um, our next author connect chat is going to be on June 23rd with, uh, Susan Fowler chatting about her book, master your motivation. And we do have a couple winners today of signed copies of fix this next, which we will be sure to get in touch with you for your best mailing address. Uh, Sue B, Madeline V, and Mike W. So we will be in touch and uh, congratulations on winning a copy of Fix This Next. Car thank you all for being here. Carmen, and thank you. I just want this also to say how great Book Pal is. It's been a wonderful experience working with you. So thank you for being of service both to readers and to authors. Oh, thank you. It's such a pleasure and loved, loved, loved your book. And definitely we will be recommending it widely. Thanks. Thank you all. Bye-bye.